Okay, everybody, we are back here, and today we are going to now start to get into the part of the unit in which we're talking about some of the political ramifications, as well as religious ramifications in some of the other nations outside, like the Holy Roman Empire and whatnot. And today we're very much going to go into England, and we're going to get a little bit of a guest appearance, if you will, by the uh, Spanish. Not necessarily a welcome one, though. Okay, so let me start off by saying that there was a little bit of a history of some tension, I guess you could say, between the kings of England and the popes. And really what it came down to this, England, because it's always kind of a little separate, what had started to develop is that a lot of the English kings felt that they should have a little bit more power over people as well as church offices than the pope. And that really came to a head in the 1200s when King Henry II um, had a series of disagreements with the Archbishop of Canterbury, a man by the name of Thomas Becket, over a variety of spiritual and control issues. Now, in the end, Henry would win only because Becket got assassinated, assassinated by some of his actual followers and friends. Henry himself always said he never actually gave the order to do that, but we'll never really know, you know, happened in the 1200s. But the reason why I bring this up is is because you're going to see the issue here is that within nations, you're going to see a lot of countries want to express their own power. And that's exactly what's going to have happen here under King Henry VIII of England. Now, Henry VIII is the king when the Renaissance breaks. And early on in his career, if you will, the English were very pro-Catholic. Henry himself was actually given the title of um, Defender of the Faith by the Pope, and he was beloved by the Catholics, and everything's going to be great. And it seemed like that would be the case, and that Henry would be someone who was going to actively fight to help the church. But then something is going to happen in the year 1527. And it is drama, drama, and more drama. Here's the deal, here's the backstory. Henry is married at this time to Catherine of Aragon, okay? You see a picture of them for their wedding photo, actually, if you will, wedding painting. Um, not the happiest picture, but whatever. Um, and they would have a child by the name of Mary. The problem is, is that Henry does not feel that women are fit to rule. And he also has a mistress at the time. Look up here to the right. Her name is Anne Boleyn. And so Henry's like, well, I got the mistress. I can totally make her my wife. We're going to get rid of Catherine because she can't have a boy and everything's going to be great. And so he's going to go to the Pope at the time, Pope Clement VII, and, and simply say, Clement, I need you to do me a favor and annul my marriage. Not divorce, annul. Now, this is very important because divorce in the Catholic Church was basically illegal at the time. But Henry claimed that the marriage actually wasn't valid because Catherine had been married to his older brother. Yes, it's gross, but these things happen. And so he's like, look, technically I, I shouldn't have even been ma married to her. It's not really legal, so annul it and it's all good. Because when you annul a marriage, it's like the marriage never happened, which is not a divorce. I know it's a technicality, but that's the deal. But what Henry was not ready for was the fact that the Pope said, yeah, this is a divorce, so I'm not going to do it. Henry was less than thrilled. So he's like, you know what, buddy? I've got my own plan. Now, this fight went on for about two years, believe it or not, from 1227 to 1229. And in 1229, he comes up with an idea, and he is helped by two of his... Um, two underlings, if you will, that were very important to him. One is Thomas Cromwell. You see I'm circling him. He's the guy on the left. Uh, he is the Chancellor of England, which is basically like the highest political position you can have underneath the king. He helped to run the country. And then over here is Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. However, he was a bit more loyal to Henry, and that's going to be key here. Thomas Cromwell is going to get Parliament to pass a piece of legislation known as the 
Act of Supremacy. And this is really, really important. What the Act of Supremacy did is one, it removed England from the Catholic Church, okay? So England is not Catholic, okay? Number two, it created what is known as, I have over here, the Anglican Church, which is the Church of England, which would be the spiritual guide of the English. Number three, the head of that church is going to be the king of England. Eventually, it's the king or queen, and it still holds today that the technical head of the church is the king, although the Archbishop of Canterbury will be the high churchman here. Um, and then it seizes all land that the Catholics had for the crown of England. Now, I'm going to talk about the impact of this in a moment. So basically, there is no Catholic Church. It's the Anglican Church. The king is the head. Super. Then in swoops Thomas Cranmer, who is now the high churchman of the Church of England, not the Catholic Church. And as a result, he will annul Henry's marriage, and he is happy. Now, for the church, this is a devastating blow. Henry and the English were one of the stronger armies in the world, not in the world, in Europe at the time. Thus, they lose all of that support. You're losing all of those um, followers within that country. That's devastating. Plus, it was a huge economic blow to the church, losing the land, losing the rents, losing the income from an entire nation of people. Um, and it was devastating. However, of course, because this would, this would work that way, things did not work with Anne because Anne gave birth to yet another girl, and her name was Elizabeth. Thus, Henry is mad. Now, I'm going to go more into the political aspect of Henry and his wives and children and stuff like that, but right now we're just focusing on the church so and the impact on the Reformation. And so Henry breaks England away. Now, when Henry dies, his son Edward will rule for a few years, and he'll keep doing what Dad was doing. But then when Edward dies, and I'll talk about how Edward shows up, but when Edward dies, his oldest daughter, Mary, becomes the queen. Mary had actually fled the nation prior because she was hated by her father because she was a Catholic, and she was very, very Catholic. So much so that she will marry King Philip II of Spain to support that Catholicism and strengthen her own position. And once she gets in power, she will go after Protestants. She basically tries to rescind most of her father's plans. She's going to put some of her own ideas in, trying to expand Catholicism, like churches and giving land back. Um, and she will kill a lot of Protestants. Uh, 300 plus at least will die under her watch, and that is why she gets the term Bloody Mary. Sadly, Mary... Um, could not bear children. It was something that really, really upset her. And I'm going to talk about this more in class because because it really was a sad situation of what she had to deal with. Um, and she is going to die, probably something like tuberculosis or pneumonia. And then upon her death, her sister, Elizabeth the first will come back in, will not back, will come into power. Now, Elizabeth is firmly Protestant and she's going to do a couple things that basically formalize and finalize what her father had started. The first thing she's going to do is pass something known as the Settlement of 1559. Now, what Elizabeth is really good at is working with Parliament and the people in her country. She didn't want to come down just on making all of these demands of religion, mainly because she wanted to keep it relatively calm. She saw all the wars of religion and things like that that were going on in, in Europe, or the rest of Europe, and I'm going to talk about that. So what does the settlement of 1559 do? All right, number one, it basically bans Catholicism, okay? Everything her sister had done, we're getting rid of all of that. Um, the king and queen officially is the only, and this is from the uh, a quote, 
the only supreme governor of this realm, as well as in all spiritual or ecclesiastical things or causes, as temporal. So meaning that not only is she in charge of all the political stuff, she's also in charge of the church, and that's just the deal. But again, she uses the title king or queen. She doesn't say Elizabeth, and this is very important because the idea is that her heirs would also have this power. Um... Now, it is passed through Parliament, so they actually debate and do some things. It was actually effective use of that. And she does not take a title, though. Something uh, her father had used the title Supreme Head of the Church, which a lot of Catholics and other people and radical Protestants really didn't like because they thought it was too Pope-like. So she's just the head of the church. I almost equivalent equivocate that to when Washington took the title of Mr. President, not his all high mighty majesty, blah, 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 like all these different things. Like you keep it simple. And what she also did is she, she didn't allow Catholics to get ahead in her country, but she wasn't going out and killing all of them. So there were still some Catholics in England. They were kind of off to the side, but it, it made it a lot smoother. And then something else she was going to get kind of finalized and published is something known as the Book of Common Prayer. Now, the Book of Common Prayer actually was created by her old, her younger brother who served before her, Edward VI. Talk about him later. But this is what it is. The, the Book of Common Prayer is a collection of prayers, the confession of faith, as well as kind of the theological explanation of the Anglican Church, as well as giving something that made it easy for people to unite around, understanding these prayers, understanding the Mass, and how everything could work. And by doing that, she made the final cross or, or, or switch from the Church, from the Catholic Church, and did it in a relatively kind of peaceful and straightforward way. That doesn't mean the Catholics were simply just going to take it, you know, and be like, okay, well, that's the end of that. There is going to be one last gasp, and it will be military. And it's really the only military thing that the English really had to deal with during the Reformation. And that was when her former brother-in-law, Philip II, decides to come after her. So I have here Elizabeth versus Philip II and Sixtus V. Here's how it works. Philip is given the ability to call a crusade against England by Pope Sixtus V. And so he is going to take his armada to try to invade and take over England. Okay. Now, this was very touchy. England had not necessarily reached its pinnacle that it would reach militarily later. The Spanish had the largest navy in the world and were considered to be the strongest navy in the world. Elizabeth, however, was very smart, and she countered not only by, by using her navy, but by employing and cutting deals with pirates so that they would fight for her, basically in exchange for her letting them go on some of their crimes. And what ends up happening, if you look at the map on the right, there were five engagements, all of which pretty much the Spanish were defeated in. But what's key here is at the end, the Spanish were able to come up and then they were forced through the English Channel, they were beaten decisively, and then they had to sail all the way around the island of Britain, so Scotland, and as well as Ireland in order to get back home. Well, so one, they got, you know, whipped because they lost, and then two, when they get up in this area by um, the Hebrides Islands in Ireland, they are uh, slammed by a huge storm. Most of the fleet is destroyed. Any survivors who managed to wash up in, in Ireland were killed. And that was the end of that. Now, both Elizabeth and her heir, James, who is her nephew, so he would be king after Elizabeth, did have one issue to deal with within the country, and that was dealing with the Puritans and the, or the Calvinists. Uh, again, the Puritans are English Calvinists, and they got quite a following in England, and here's why. I have here an issue. Basically, there were many people in England who did not like the Catholic Church, and they felt that the Anglican Church was really just, I guess you could say, like Catholic light. 
So they were looking for something more radical, and they got into Calvinism. And so the Puritans were a very large group within the country that were very that was very outspoken against Elizabeth, and would be actually very much outspoken against James. Um, again, they wanted a stricter nation. They wanted a theocracy very similar to what we saw in Geneva and whatnot. Um, many of them would be sent to jail. However, many of them also decided to leave and eventually would found the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, so interestingly enough, some of that persecution would, would lead to them coming over here. But in the end, they never really could bolster enough that they could necessarily overthrow it. Although the overthrow like Elizabeth or James, although the Puritans will play a very, very large role in the English Civil War that would happen under the next king, Charles I. So we're going to talk about that later, but what we see here is England is out. They are Protestant. They are not coming back, and it, it was a drastic change, okay? So uh, I'll talk to you guys in class tomorrow. Make sure you get your assignment done. See you soon.